kicked off about three months ago, somewhere in here. So if you have your Bibles, uh, please open them to Colossians chapter 2. I will have a lot of text on the screen, uh, but I just want you guys to pretty primarily stay in Colossians chapter 2. The rest of the text you guys can see up here, and I'll try and pause on the more in-depth one. So who knows where Colossians is? In New Testament. New Testament, very good. Where? After what book? From the Philippians. Okay. Okay, Colossians chapter 2. Um, I do have a lot of text, and some of this may seem academic, or it may seem like that's going over the same text over and over again, but I want you to know that every single text in this Bible has been hard fought and won by Jesus Christ. Every text is important. It's like saying, I'm going to show you a $100 bill. Wouldn't that be powerful to say, look, here's a $100 bill, you guys see one of them? But what if I showed you another one? And then I showed you another one, and another one, and another one, and just kept going. That's really what it is when we're looking at every single text in the Bible on any given subject. They're all riches. So sometimes it may seem, well, that's boring, but would you really say that's boring to keep laying out $100 bills in front of you? No, I wouldn't. It's like, show me more. Show me more. Jesus Christ came down from heaven to teach us something. And a lot of people are really abusing Colossians chapter 2. They go to this text and this text alone. I've been warred against against this text. People have brought up this text over and over and over again. So I want you to take a look at it in Colossians chapter 2 verse 14. verse 14. So take a look at Colossians chapter 2 verse 14. And when you get there say Amen. 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 That was a little weak. Can I get a louder amen? amen. Okay, good. Good people are in here. Okay. So it says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Next verse. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And then in verse 16 it says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. And in verse 17, which, all those things we just discussed, are a what? Shadow, Shadow of things. things to come, but... The body is of Christ. I want to pray one more time. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and to share once more. Lord, that every word may fill my own heart and their hearts with the joy and the peace of knowing and understanding, especially in knowing you and your son, Jesus Christ. Lord God, that it may be more than just a mere doctrine, that it may be about a person. Help me, Lord God. Grant thy Holy Spirit, I pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, this text obviously in verse 14 to 17, but we start with verse 14, it says blotting it out. And then it mentions those things, right? The meat, the drink, the respect of the holy day, the new moon, or the what? The Sabbath day. Sabbath day. So what do you do with that, right? So let's take a look at this. So we're going to go back to Colossians 2.14 and see that when Paul spoke of blotting out, it could not possibly be the what? Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. The law of God, which are being referred to. Why? Paul stated that they, that's the Ten Commandments, are still here pointing out what? Sin. sin. If they're pointing out sin, how could they be blotted out? In fact, how did you know you were a sinner? God's law tells you that you're a sinner. The law still exists. It's not blotted out. It's not nailed to the cross. It still exists. In fact, how did you know you needed a Savior? That very law points out your sin and my sin. So that's 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, for sin is the transgression of the law, right? And then Romans 7, 7, I did no sin except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. And being written upon the heart by the Holy what? Oh, Holy Ghost. That's in Hebrews 8, 8 through 13 and 10, 16, which is the new covenant. God says, I will write what in your hearts? My laws. He's actually quoting Jeremiah. And if you read the context of Jeremiah, my laws always refer to... Ten Commandments. Jeremiah was the first one that said that. Jeremiah 31. All right. If we could wake up our brother right here, please. You should just tap him. A little bit harder. You want to make sure he's awake for this. Brother Elisha. Are you awake, Brother Elisha? Need some help? I might have to have some help in the back, Brother Rick, with this, because it's kind of a long distance with this. 
Any four of you won? Let me see if I can go back one. Back one? Yeah, my four is not working. So just four of you won, and I'll just have to let you know. So it says, blotting out the what? Handwriting. Handwriting of? Ordinances. Is the same thing about the law of God there? Uh, no, it says what? Ordinances. ordinances. God's word is very specific. It says that was? Against, against us. Is God's law for us or against us? Uh, for us. Uh, you be careful. Which was what? Contrary. Contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So when we're looking to understand these texts, we want to know it's handwriting. Their ordinances, they were against. They were contrary, right? And it's singular, it, right? And it was nailed to what? His cross. His, cross. His Jesus's cross. Can you forgive me one brother? It says, what specifically is the hand writing of ordinances that Paul is speaking of? For me again, please. So by the hand of Moses is in all these texts, and I'm going to go briefly through them. I'm not going to read every single one, but if you uh, look at all these texts, the hand of Moses is in all of these. And so if you read those, you'll understand what the hand or the handwriting is. Let's take a look at the next slide. Just as a for instance. Notice this in Leviticus 8.36. It says, So Aaron and his sons did all the things which the Lord commanded by what? The hand of Moses. By the hand of Moses. Next text, please. Next screen. And that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken unto them by what? By the hand of Moses. In Leviticus 10.11. Next one. Again, notice all that same stuff by what? The hand of Moses. Next one. These were they that were numbered by the families of the Kohathites, all that might do service in the tabernacle of the congregation, which Moses and Aaron did number according to the commandment of the Lord by what? Aaron. So notice who's also who's involved in this. Aaron. And the tabernacle. 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 See that? Okay. And the Kohathites. They were part of the priests. Yeah, the Marathites, the Kohathites, those guys. All right, next slide, please. These be those that were numbered to the families of the sons of Merari. Those are again the Kohathites, the Merarites, and those guys. By the what? Aaron. Next slide. And by the hand of Moses. Moses, notice this. Notice they were numbered, everyone according to his service. service. Talking about the priests. Next slide. Again, at the commandment of the Lord, they rested in the tents. And at the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. They kept the charge of the Lord at the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. So that means Moses is actually being a what here? A hand. A hand for who? A hand for God, right? Jesus specifically talking to him. Moses is the go-between. When God spoke the Ten Commandments, did he need Moses in the way? Yes. No. no. God himself came down upon Mount Sinai and spoke those Ten Commandments by his own voice, wrote them with his own finger. But the rest of the things, what were they written by? Specifically by Moses. Now let's keep going here. Let's keep going. And they first took their journey according to the commandment of the Lord by the? And the Moses. See how this goes? Okay, one more. And the Moses, one more. And the Moses again. And again. And again, one more. I just want to see, there's tons of this. So if you don't understand what it means in the book of Colossians, how many texts do you have? Many, many. There's no way to be confused what Colossians 2 says. All you got to know is understand where Paul is quoting from and understand the use. Next verse. Again, again, Joshua continues this by the hand of Moses. Next one. Uh, next one. I just want you to see that it's over and over and over again. Next one. And there's one I want to stop on if I get to it. Keep going. Mm, one more. Keep going. There it is. Take this out. Now notice what it says here. That's Second Chronicles 33 8. Neither will I any more remove the foot of Israel from out of the land which I have appointed for your father, so that they will take heed to do all that I have commanded them, according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances. So is the law separate from the statutes and separate from the ordinances? No. Yes. yes. It listed. It's like the difference between the carrots and the peas and the onions, right? Very, very specific. Notice the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances by who? So did Moses have anything to do with ordinances? Absolutely. So when Paul quotes this in Colossians chapter 2, he says, blotting out the handwriting of? Did he say blotting out the law? Did he say blotting out the statutes? He did not. He said ordinances, right? Next one. Now notice this. 2 Chronicles 35, 6, same context. So kill the and sanctify yourselves and prepare your brethren that you may do according to the word of the Lord by. So what's associated with the ordinances of the hand of Moses? 
Passover. So what's the Passover? It's an ordinance. Do you and I physically keep Passover day? Do we go sacrifice a lamb somewhere? No. No, we have the real lamb, right? We keep the real feast by faith. We don't keep that physical feast anymore. We have the spiritual feast. I know that there's some evidence to say you need to keep all of these in the literal days. That's nonsense. We'll get to that hopefully a little bit later. But I just want to see, show you that the connection of the Passover with the hand of Moses and ordinances are tied together. There's many more. Uh, four, please. Again, again, notice. Oh, go back one. Made us known to them by Holy Sabbath and commanded us them precepts, statutes, laws by. So is the Sabbath separate from this? Yes. This is the Sabbath of the Lord. Notice the Holy Sabbath compared to the rest of it. Next one. And take this book of the... And put it in where? The side of the, the, side of the ark. So let's pretend that this is the ark. And if I... And the inside underneath the shelf here, this is where the Ten Commandments go, right? Inside. Yeah. Yeah. Now, where does this book go? On the side. In the... Side. side, right? Or to the... Off to the side, right? It doesn't go into the same place. Totally separate. God himself made distinction between the two. What were the Ten Commandments written on? Not a book. What were the Ten Commandments written on? Stone from the throne of God. What were these written on? We call it a book. Could be deer hide, could be vellum, could be Egyptian papyri. We don't know exactly specifically what that book was. But it was basically a scroll, right? And a scroll will wear out, will it not? When you open it, you read it, it what? Falls apart. But stone, what? Lasts a really long time. For instance, you, your kitchen countertop, what do you want it made of? Stone, like marble, right? Solid rock. All right, let's see if I can go forward. Oh, good, wait, I'll see if I can forward one. Go back one. So gather to me all you the elders of the tribes, your officers, that may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to what? What was recorded against them? What did Israel promise to God? In Exodus chapter 19. Who knows their Bible? Before the Ten Commandments were even spoken, what did Israel promise God on Mount Sinai? All that the Lord has said what? We will do. That's a promise. So guess what the Lord recorded? I call heaven and earth to what? Record against them. Their promise was recorded along with everything that God told them that they would do. So what was against them? Not God's words. Their faulty promises, which they did not keep. Because they promised to keep a vow before God. We were going to do everything that the Lord has said. That is held what? Against you. Everything you say will be held against you in a court of law. They made a promise. It's like they swore upon the Bible, yes, Lord, I will keep and do and so and so. And they did it. So that means their side of the covenant was broken from square one. It was always recorded to get them, but they had promised to keep it. And that's why when you read the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, it says that the promise was like bitterness in the mouth, gnashing of the teeth. It says the children, it's like, why'd you guys find our parents and make that promise? We can't keep it. Uh, forward one, please. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. Is this the same word used in Colossians? It is. That I have set before you what? And what was the death? Blessing and cursing. cursing. Is there any death in the, in the law of God, the Ten Commandments? No, the Bible says the law was for life. Is there any cursing in the Ten Commandments? No. Where was the cursing written? In the book of the law. And why? Because if you broke the promise... You no longer got the blessing in the Ten Commandments. You got the cursing that was written down. That's what's against them, not God's law. God's law is for life. It was never meant as a curse. Next one, please. That's why it says to life. So because of the promises they had made, which turned out to be what? Faulty. Faulty promises. You find that in the book of Hebrews, chapter 8. They broke their side of the covenant, made in where? Exodus 19 and 24. Golden calf incident here, then they had a second chance, and they did it again. These words Moses wrote upon what? Parchment, Parchment and sprinkled with blood. with blood. Their agreement was the promises to do all 
that the Lord has said we will, will do. do. Where's the aspect in there? What is this? Who's going to do it? We will. What's the new covenant? God says, I will write my law within their hearts. The old covenant is us without God. It says we will. God, God's not even in this picture. All that what it says, we are going to do it. They didn't even rely upon God's strength or his mercy. They, they said, we're, we can, we're fine. We can do it, God. Just tell us what to do. We'll be able to do it. So God said, jump over that mountain. You think you'll be able to do it? It requires God's power and strength to do that. And so they were trying to do it by themselves. And Exodus 19, 4, fault with who? Yeah. Hebrews 8, 8. God said he found fault with them, not the Ten Commandments. Is there any fault in the commandments of God? No, the Bible says that the law of the Lord is perfect. So how can he find fault with the law of God? Fault with what? Yeah. Them. Who's them? The ones that made the promises. We will do it, Lord. Did they? No. Golden calf incident and the rest of the, the history that goes on. So God found fault with them, which was their covenant, which they break, and was nailed to the cross. cross. Their promise was nailed to the cross in Christ because he did it for them. As Jesus kept the what? What did Jesus keep? The vows. The vows. Did Jesus ever sin? No. Was he a Jew? Was he under the law? Yes. Jesus kept everything. He kept every single vow that you and I had failed to have kept at that point. In so nullifying the old, the what? The new or the everlasting was ratified by the blood of Jesus, the true sacrifice. Next slide, please. There were curses associated with the breaking of their covenant, their promises they had made with God. You can see that in Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 68. I don't have time to read all this because there's so many texts. You want homework? There it is, 28, 15 through 68, where Del talks about the promises and the curses. Next slide, please. Notice this. Christ has redeemed us from God's law. Curse. curse. The what? Curse. The curse. Find me a curse anywhere in the Ten Commandments. You will never find it. So therefore, when it says curse of the law, what is it talking about? The stuff that was in the ark or the stuff on the side of the ark? The side. So when it says the law, that's what it's talking about. Being made a curse. curse for us. Why? Because Jesus took our sins upon himself. We become innocent. He became guilty. We became free from God's wrath. Jesus took the wrath. Right? That's what was nailed to the cross. In fact, Jesus even made um, note of this to the Nicodemus. Like the serpent lifted upon a blood on what? You guys are awfully quiet. Am I losing you? You guys know your Bible. When the Son of Man is lifted up, it says like a serpent on a pole. Why a serpent? A serpent is the sign of the devil. It's a sign of sin. It's a sign of all that stuff. Because he became sin for us. His very flesh is sinful flesh. He took upon the nature of mankind physically, nailing it to his cross. For it is written, cursed is everyone that what? Hangs on, the Hangs on a tree. And guess where your old man of sin is going to go? Hangs on a tree. Next slide, please. So, where is there any curses among ten, ten commandments of God? There are none. none. Those are all what? Isn't that what Ephesians 6 2 says? It starts out talking about the commandment to obey or honor your father and your mother. It says, which is the first commandment with the promise. It's not the first and only commandment with the promise, it's talking about the second table. Every commandment of God is a promise of God to you in the new covenant. He says, you shall honor no gods in the new covenant. You shall not murder or kill in the new covenant. It doesn't become the negative. We look at it on the negative side so much. We need to look at it from the side of mercy, the side of grace, the side of overcoming. It's a sign of God's promise to you, written in stone forever. And then he writes it in your heart, forever. You shall remember to keep the Sabbath. You shall honor your father and your mother. It's no longer, no, it's, you're going to, because by my Holy Spirit, you are going to overcome. It is eternal promises. They are all perfect. And you can check that out in those verses there. So, what about what he, Jesus, was to cause to cease? Is it God's spiritual Ten Commandments, which Jesus magnified and made honorable? In Isaiah? It says he would magnify the law and make it, make it honorable. If he nails it to the cross, how can you make it honorable? It means to honor it and keep it. 
God's Ten Commandments are carnal or spiritual. spiritual. For that which pertain unto the oblation and sacrifices, which are all part of the what? Because that's what a sacrifice is. In the Ten Commandments, is there anything about this? No. It's all this. Notice this. Daniel 9, 27. And he, Jesus, shall confirm the... Covenant. That's the everlasting covenant. With many for... One week. One week. And we know that week was split up into two, right? His first three and a half years that Jesus ministered, he died. In the next three and a half years, his disciples took it forward, finally with the stoning of Stephen, right? That's the full week. And in the midst of the week, AD 31, he, Jesus, shall what? Isn't that what Paul was saying in Colossians chapter 2? That he nailed the ordinances to the cross? It's no longer required that I sacrifice any of that stuff. I don't have to keep the Passover in that manner. Jesus is the Passover, according to Corinthians. He himself is going to cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. It doesn't say causing the law of God to cease. The law of God or Ten Commandments are the law of what? Life. Life. That's why Jesus and Moses would say, choose what? Life. <laughs> to transgress them is to what? Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is? Is death. And sin is the transgression of the law. And they're not ever against the promises of God. The law of God is never against his own promises. That would be silly. They're always what? Harmony. Harmony with him being the very foundation of his government. And if you study that in Exodus chapter 19... Through 24, God's Ten Commandments were written from his very throne. Blue sapphire stone from his throne. That's the foundation of his own government, his very character. And in fact, each of the Ten Commandments is a promise of God in the New Covenant. Next slide, please. Notice what Paul says here. Is the law then what? Against the promises of God. What does Paul say? Really, he's saying, No! Therefore, when it says blotting out the handwriting of, of ordinances against us, is the law of God against us then? No. Then it can't possibly be nailed to the cross. Does that make sense? People take one verse out of Colossians and read nothing else Paul said on it for some reason. It's amazing. Because Colossians 2.14 says the ordinances. Take a look at this. Next slide, please. What text am I going to read here? Because when the Bible says it in one place, do you know that it says it in, in another place, and in another place, and in another place? If you're ever confused about any one statement anywhere, whether it's Paul or Old Testament, Isaiah, you can go read Jeremiah. You can go read Daniel. You can go read any other prophet, and they're going to tell you. In fact, Paul wrote both of these. He wrote Colossians, and he wrote Ephesians. Ephesians. So let's see if Paul explains Paul. Having abolished in his the enmity, the hatred, right, the warring against God, even the law of contained in ordinances. So did he say the law? No. Did he say the commandments? No. He said the law of commandments contained where? In ordinances. He's basically saying the rules that God wrote down in ordinances through Moses. For to make in himself of twain one new man, Jew and Gentile, right, or united in Christ, so making Peace. Next slide, please. He's using those very same words. You know what Hebrew says the same thing? It says, then verily the first covenant, that's the old covenant, had what? Ordinances. 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 Of what? Ordinances. Service. Service. And a? Worldly. Heavenly? Worldly. Worldly, right? Next slide, please. Which stood in? Peace. And? Drinks. Did Paul mention that in Colossians chapter 2 about a meat and drink? Paul is saying the exact same thing in Hebrews. He says the exact same thing in Ephesians. He's not saying anything different. So if you're confused about Colossians 2, go to Ephesians chapter 2. Go to Hebrews chapter 9 through 10. It says, and diverse washings, washings right? They would wash their hands, wash their pots, wash their feet, wash their head, right? It's like mini baptisms. And carnal what? Ordinances. What are the ordinances? Carnal. Are they spiritual or carnal? Carnal. Is the Ten Commandments of God spiritual or carnal? Spiritual. Spiritual. How do you nail something which is spiritual to anything? But if it's carnal, like flesh, can I nail it to something? Right? I can nail it to that door. Bang. But if it's spiritual, like an idea, can I nail it to that door? No. 
You cannot nail God's Ten Commandments to a door. But you can nail carnal ordinances, such as diverse meats and drinks, imposed on them until... Time statement. What? Time Reformation. Next slide, please. And notice this. Because this is related to that previous slide. You already read the next slide. Because it's time to say ordinances. Notice this. Numbers 9, 12 connects the two. They shall leave none of it unto the morning, nor break any bone of it. Right? Jesus' bones was not broken. According to all the ordinances of the... They shall what? Keep it. So because Christ became our Passover, it was nailed to the cross. The cross. I don't have to go sacrificing a sheep or a, you know, a cow or a bird anymore. Jesus Christ is the real sacrifice. He was nailed to it. Next slide, please. Notice this. He said to me, Son of Man, thus saith the Lord, this is Ezekiel, these are the... Of the... He didn't say of the commandments. It's of the altar, of the worldly sanctuary. To offer what? Burn to sprinkle? Blood thereof. Do you see all the worldly, carnal, fleshly things that the ordinances are dealing with? It's not the spiritual Ten Commandments of God. Next slide, please. In fact, Ezekiel is a great thing. We already read that passage over the hand of Moses. Again, making that connection. Next slide. And they were both righteous before God, talking about um, the parents of John the Baptist. Walking in all the commandments. What's that word? And. and. What does and mean? If I said one and one equals two, what does and mean? One and one equals two. What does and mean? Addition. Right? So if I have the commandments and ordinances, this is not this, right? Right? Very plain. Notice the next slide, please. Some have said that the handwriting of ordinances is the record of what? Sin. Sin, or the sin debt. But is that correct. correct? That's the new modern theology. Even when I first came into the church, I first thought this because I heard so many other preachers teach this. I even wrote uh, to my pastor about this, and this is where it really was. But when you study it out, no, not possible. Next slide. Here it is in Greek. Can anybody read that? Anybody? No. Okay. It says, Cairo graphon tois dogmasin. Cairo graphon. Graph means writing, Cairo's hand. Tois means basically in or of, there's a few translations. Dogma. How many of you guys know what dogma is? Like religious stuff, right? Dogma sin. The handwriting of ordinances or dogmas or decrees. Next slide. That phrase does not mean sin record. It does not mean sin debt ever, anywhere. You can break down that word into its individual parts. Never means what? Certificate of debt. It doesn't ever mean certificate of debt. The very word literally means handwriting of ordinances. That's the Greek, in case somebody tries to go to the Greek on you. There's a lot of people who try to go to the Greek, and so I go to the Greek first. Lead them to it. Next slide. You don't have to stress yourself out on that, but I just want you to know the evidence is even deeper than you think. The word chirographer literally means hand writing. And it's translated as hand how many times? Or hands. It's never not translated that. It's always translated. And guess how many think I looked up? All of them. All of them. And graphone means what? You know, in your pencil, it has usually graphite, right? It's what you write with, a stencil or something. It's translated as written what? And write how many times? And wrote how many times? And describe it, meaning to be written down. And writing. Where is sin debt in any of that? It's not. And toise can have several meanings, but it usually means of in the sense, just in, of, that. And dogma sin literally means... Or it's translated exactly the same way as Decrees. in Luke 2 1, in Acts 16 4, in Acts 17 7, or ordinances, ordinances in Ephesians 2 15 and Colossians 2 14. The related word in Colossians 2 is dogma sithe. It's at the end. The rudiments of the world or ordinances. Notice, what is it? It's not the spiritual things of heaven. It's not talking about the law of God. It's talking about the basic things like the lamb, the blood, the altar. Uh, the Passover, uh, the oil, those things. It's the rudiments, the, the, the bare fundamentals of earth. Next slide, please. I know some of this is deep. It's also related words to what? 
Rites and ceremonies. It's where you get the word what? There are people that will really say, Adventist, where do you get that phrase between moral law and ceremonial law in your Bible? You know that I know probably not one person in this room could probably show me that. I haven't been a single Adventist online who was able to show me that. They always assumed it. They took the writings of the pioneers and said, yeah, there's a moral law and ceremonial law. Prove it from your Bible. Guess what? It's translated what? Ceremonies. Which means it's a ceremonial law. But you won't know that until we study it. Let the children of Israel also keep the Passover. And then it says, keep it, that's the Passover, all the, right. or the, ceremonies. or the, ceremonies. rites or ceremonies are, what's the word in Colossians 2? Ceremonies. Starts with an O. Ordinances. Ordinances, right? Same thing. Keep the rites of it. Keep the ceremonies of it. Keep the ordinances of it. Same word. Same meaning. So when he's talking about blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, he's talking about you don't have to physically keep that Passover anymore. You don't have to physically keep the Day of Atonement. You're keeping the spiritual aspect of it. Right? Is it Jesus Christ your Passover right now? Right? You're not waiting for a day in the year to keep it. You're keeping it right now. Next slide. What time do I have? 48. Can I go a little bit longer? A little bit longer. Rites is translated as ordinance 12 times, so I didn't make it up. You can't just say, Brother Aaron, you pointed out rites. It's translated that way itself by the Bible. It's translated as ordinances 10 times. Next slide. Notice this. And this day shall be unto you a memorial. You shall keep it. That's the Lord's Passover, verse 12. A feast. Keep it by a feast by a... So the Passover is a... Am I making this up, or is that what the Bible is saying, line upon line? Next slide, please. And you also observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Next down, you observe this day by what? The Lord said to Moses, this is the ordinance of the... Passover. Couldn't make it any more clear what the Passover was. It's an ordinance. Next slide, please. Therefore, thou shalt keep this... Talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread in his... Isn't that what Colossians 2 talked about? Feast days. Right? Then it links the feast days to the ordinances. Yeah. Next slide, please. And the stranger shall sojourn among you, and will keep the Passover according to the ordinance, ordinance of the Passover, and the manner thereof you shall do, you shall have one ordinance. ordinance. Next slide, please. Again, this is so plain. One ordinance, ordinance talking about the meat and drink offerings of the previous 14 verses. And they're called what? Ordinance. So the meat and drink offerings are called ordinance. ordinances according to Numbers 15, 15, and the previous context. Next slide. This is the ordinance, a red heifer, cow, without spot, where it is no blemish, upon which never came yoke. It's really a symbol of Jesus Christ. But it's called a... Did you guys ever have to pull a, a red heifer out of your yard and go... Oh. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. Because he nailed that thing to the cross. Next slide. Notice this. Me offering every... Sixth part of an ephah, the third part of the hin of oil, a meat offering continually by a perpetual or ongoing or continual ordinance. Meat and drink offerings, right? Oils. Next slide. And these are again the rites, ordinances. Move along, please. Again, ordinances. This goes on and on. According to the go back one more to show you again. According to all the ordinances of the Passover. Okay, next one. And notice this. It says, this is Ezekiel because Paul is quoting from Ezekiel. You guys didn't know. It says, if they shall be ashamed of all that they have done, show them the form of the house. He's talking about the sanctuary, the third temple. It's a symbol of Jesus Christ. And you, by the way. And the fashion thereof, and the goings out thereof, and the comings in thereof, and all the forms thereof, all the ordinances, ordinances of thereof. the sanctuary. All the forms of, and all the law thereof, and write it, handwriting, right? right? And all the, you see how it's connected, next verse. What are the ordinances also going to do with? And? And? And blood. Next one. All the ordinances of the? Of the? Next, next slide. I just want you guys to see the words over and over again so that when you go back and look at this yourself, you can see where these words are. Ceremonies is translated ordinances and ordinances that many times. It's never tra not translated that. Next thing. Next slide. Or did that. Oh, we did that. It's okay. It's just, it's just covering the word ceremonies again. I don't have to cover this so we can skip past that again. Again, okay, here we go, back one, back one. Now we understand that ordinances are and what they are associated with, especially in the context of the handwriting of Moses in the book, right? 
Are they the same as the Ten Commandments? You guys are dead. No. Good, no. Next slide. Here's a visual. If everything I just told you is lost on you, this one slide will show you. But I can't just show you the one slide. I have to show you the work leading up to my answer. I'm telling you, non adventists are going to come to you in the last days, and you better be able to explain it. Because you are to glorify God in that moment to either win them to the Lord or be as an answer against theirs. There's no middle ground. Notice this. It's called what in Colossians 2.14? What is the Ten Commandments called? They're called the law of God. God. Notice, what are these these ordinances called here? Carnal, Carnal, right? Dealing with the sacrifices. But what is God's Ten Commandments called? It deals with obedience. obedience. It doesn't deal with anything but sacrifice, right? What are they called in Hebrews? What is um, God's Ten Commandments from? God said, see that you have spoken to you from heaven. God's law is not a dessert, in case you didn't know that. What are they called in Colossians 2.17, eh? Shadow. Shadow. But what is God's law called? Life. Law is a life, right? Just like the words of lamp on my feet, right? All those texts. Thy law is life. If it's light, how could it ever be with shadow? They are not the same thing. It is night and day. Notice the next one. Colossians 2.16, Ephesians 2.17, and Hebrews 9.11 and 10, one, all talking about the same thing. It says that those were shadows, what? To come. To come. What is to come? Past, present, or future? Future. Future. Notice this, Exodus 20, verse 8, talking about God's Sabbath commandment. The first word is, is that past, present, or future? To remember the past. past. So is the future the same thing as the past? No. No. Can they be talking about the same Sabbath then? No. It's impossible. This one slide is absolute proof, but I just want you guys to see the homework of a couple more minutes. Let's see how much more I can go through here. A little bit more. Next slide, please. Here's a longer list, and there's no way I'm going to read that to you. If you want to listen, the picture on our website. (laughs) But I'll just read a few things. It's called the Law of Moses. It's called the Law of Jehovah. It's spoken by Moses, spoken by God. It's called the Law Consisting in Decrees. It's called the Kingly Royal Law, written by Moses, written by God, in a book, on stone, Uh, on the side of the ark, inside the ark. Ended at the cross, stands forever. Added because of sin, points out sin. Uh, Was to be added and built up, the law of God is complete. This one was temporary. This one's eternal. This was against us. This is not burdensome, meaning it's for us. This one was contrary and not good. This one's holy, just, and good. How can God's law, which is holy, just, and good, be counted as the same thing which is not good? You'd have a massive contradiction in your Bible. This one points out the Savior, right? Shadows and types. What does the law of God do? Points out sin. Uh, this one judges no one, but what does God's law do? Judges everything. Right? You're not judged by the, the sacrificial lamb. You're judged by the law of God. Notice this. This one says it's carnal. This one says spiritual. Must not keep. Must not break. Yoke of bondage. Law of liberty. How can one be a yoke of bondage and one law of liberty be talking about the same thing? They're not. This one has made nothing perfect. This one is perfect. This one is a burden. This one's a delight. This one was abolished. This one's magnified. Till the seed should come. Temporary. This one's still heaven and earth shall pass. It goes beyond that. And this is a whole law not to be kept and a whole law to be kept. Next slide, please. That one slide shows you everything that we just covered. We have the example of Jesus who lived according to his father's what? Eternal. And what? God. And resurrected according to the types. His line represents the law, but it also represents the shadows of time because they're united in Jesus Christ. But was Jesus' spirit nailed to the cross or was his flesh nailed to the cross? Flesh. His flesh was nailed to the cross. Very key. Mm-hmm. The Bible says that which is flesh is flesh, and that which is spirit is spirit. Do not mix the two. Next slide. Notice this. It says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a what? It's again, 1 Corinthians. As ye are, for even Christ our Passover is, present tense, sacrificed for us. So if our Passover is sacrificed, do I ever need to do it again? No. no. Next slide, please. Notice this, first fruits. But now is Christ what? Risen. So when did he become the first fruits? When he risen from the dead. When he risen from the dead, right? That's good English. <laughs> and he became the first fruits of them that slept. But Christ is the So do I need to literally keep a feast every year? Or is Christ my first fruits? Christ. He is. I'm not looking for another day. Next one. And the reason why you have to go over that because a lot of people that misquote that verse and say that Paul said we need to keep the feast. 
That's even Advent to say you need to keep the feast. And the other one in Colossians 2 says has been abolished. Which is it? It's both. The physical aspect is abolished. The spiritual aspect remains. Christ is our Passover sacrifice. You always need Christ. Christ is our first fruit. You always need the first fruits. You still need the Day of Atonement, right? You're not talking about the physical Day of Atonement that they had on the 10th day, right? Having spoiled principalities and powers, again, Colossians 2, notice, context. What did Jesus Christ do? The word spoiled means to obtain the victory. He robbed them of it, right? It's like you go to conquer an army and you take the spoils. Principalities and powers, he made a what? Show. A show of them, how? Triumph over them in it. Next slide. Where are you quoting from, Paul? Wouldn't that help? Wouldn't you want to know where Paul's quoting from? Like, if all of a sudden I gave you this big paragraph, wouldn't you want to know where I got that paragraph from if I'm quoting something? Paul. Paul is quoting from Psalms 98, verses 1, 2, and 3, in Colossians chapter 2. It says, O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. For he hath done marvelous things. His right hand, that's Jesus Christ, his holy arm had what? The victory. Next slide. The Lord hath made known his salvation. His righteousness. Hath he openly showed. Isn't that what Colossians 2 just talked about? He spoiled them, showed them openly. In the sight of the heathen, heathen at the principalities of powers. Next slide. That he remembered his mercy and his truth. Right? The two go together. Mercy and, and justice together. Mercy and truth are together in Christ. Toward the house of Israel, all the ends of the earth have seen. In Jesus, the salvation of our God. So when you read Colossians chapter 2, talking about just before verse 13, Paul is quoting Psalms 98, 1 through 3. Next verse. Next slide. And you can study this out, and we're going to take a break after this, because I'll have to do a part 3. The words, made a show of them openly, e beg met has seen, like dogma sin. It's related. Colossians 2.15. It's also similarly used in Matthew 1 9 where it says what? A public example. What does that mean? What's a public example? It's like somebody where some, somebody is censored openly in front of everybody. It's not a secret. Did Jesus die on the cross in a little corner? No. No. He did it before how much? Everybody. All the universe. It was a public example. Openly. God was not trying to hide anything. If anything, he opened all the books of heaven in Christ. Here's the, here it is. Here's my heart. Bang, there it is. I've hidden nothing. And Satan was the one hiding everything. In Hebrews 6, 6, it means to what? Open chain. It's an open chain. Because Jesus Christ was clothed or naked on that cross. Naked. He was very much naked. Because it said nakedness. That's why he says despising the shame. He hated the shame. And it means something which is done before all, to make known before all. Psalms 92, he made known that all the ends of the earth have what? Seen. Seen the salvation of our God. There's nobody that doesn't really know this. This is restated in Acts 26, 26. Next slide. Notice. For the king, Herod the II, knoweth of these things, before whom I, Paul, speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things, the death of Jesus Christ, the resurrection, all that stuff that happened to him, are hidden from him, King Agrippa. Why? For this thing, the cross, Calvary, was not done in a corner. corner because Jesus Christ did it openly. I have said nothing in secret. Satan is the one that says those things in secret. That's where you get backbiting and whisperings and all that filth. It's Satan. Jesus Christ does it openly. He'll tell you plainly. Next slide. The word spoiled is also means to? Put off. It's put off, meaning to strip away, remove, as take away the power, take away your authority, take away your goods. Like if you're a ruler of a kingdom, and I'm a ruler of a kingdom, and I come and conquer you, I spoiled you. I took away your authority and all your goods. Right? As a garment being laid aside, carried away, captive. So he took everything that the enemy had and took it from him. Satan was the god of this world because he robbed it from Adam. But when Jesus Christ died on the cross, what did he take back? He took back the world. Jesus Christ is now the god of this world. That's why Satan cannot go back to heaven. We're going to break there on the slide. Can you remember me for that slide, please? I'm going to close the prayer. I know it's 
Some of it may seem dry to you guys, but I want you to understand that when you study philosophy too, you have an answer. Jesus Christ lived his entire life that you might have that answer. He inspired Paul that you might have that answer. In fact, he told Paul to write it down in Colossians and Ephesians and in Hebrews. In fact, he told Ezekiel to write it down way before him. And we're going to cover that uh, if I ever get back up. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we just want to thank you for the time to gather together to study your word. If any have questions, God, they might go to you. They might ask you for wisdom and understanding. Lord, I got upon my knees and asked you for the truth. You have always answered that prayer. You have ever been faithful. And you have provided more abundantly than even I thought to ask. I pray, God, they may have the same experience, that they may go to you in trust, go to you in faith, go to you in hope, that they may receive the answers they need in their life. How to overcome this sin, overcome that thought, overcome that speech, overcome that action. Lord, that each one may come to you in trust, saying, Lord, help me. Help my unbelief. How am I to believe to overcome? Lord, that everyone here may be overcoming in Jesus Christ, that none may be lost. Truly, God, I pray for each soul here. Lord, hear their hearts cry. And see those who are not may not even be praying. Lord, have mercy upon them. Lord, grant them my Holy Spirit. Grant them conversion. Grant me conversion. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That we may have our closing. Yeah. And be abide with me, tis even time. each one here. We thank you again. We pray everything in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.
announcements or announcements? Yes. Church, if you've been blessed with the message tonight, we'll say amen. Thank God for the uh, spirit and the water flying.